Good. This is Minnesota in August, right? It's a state fair. It's humidity. It's heat. It's also boating. How many of you guys love to be on a boat? Yeah. I love being on a boat, especially because I don't own a boat. So when anyone invites me on their boat, that's the goodness of the Lord. I tell people all the time, like, what did Jesus' closest friends do? They took them on their boat. Like, that's, that's what they invited them over for dinner. Like, that's, I want to be like Jesus. Uh, this week, though, I don't own a boat, so we rented a boat for a day. And we got to go boating, me, my sisters, their husbands, and my parents. And it was just a good time to get out on the water. We happened to pick the one day, though, that it wasn't very hot. Uh, it was on Friday. And so the weather was kind of iffy, cloudy, whatever it might be. And so we got on the boat, pontoon boat on Lake Minnetonka, and we're going across uh, Browns Bay, which is like the biggest, deepest area. And if, if you've ever been to Lake Minnetonka, there's all these different bays. It's really like lots and lots of lakes put together. That's why it's probably the most popular lake to go on in Minnesota. And as we're going through that, I was driving, and the waves are a little bit choppy. And it was like, man, this is the biggest probably section of Lake Minnetonka. And so I kind of turned up and go a little faster, and everyone's kind of bouncing around. They're like, can you slow down? And I was like, we got to get through this section. Uh, it's a little more choppy. Get through the wind and the waves here. And then once we get to these smaller bays, it's going to be a little more sheltered, and it's going to be better. So we had to kind of suffer through the wind and the waves to get to where we need to go. And I was thinking about that how so often we know we need to go somewhere else, but to get there, we got to get through the wind and the waves first. How many times in our own lives? We know that, right? We want to go here. We got to get through the wind and the waves first. Have you ever been through some waves? There's a great little acronym for waves, and I think sometimes waves are God-ordained, these things we go through, and sometimes they're things that we create ourselves that we go through. Uh, we don't have note sheets, but probably everyone in here has a smartphone, so I want to encourage you, pull out your notes app and take some notes uh, this evening. We're in the week five of our BLESS series. We're talking about sharing your story. And again, you want to write this down. Here's just some waves I think we go through. Number one, W. Our words. I think sometimes we create anxiety and waves by the words we speak. We say something we didn't mean to say. And sometimes I think we get these waves in our lives because someone else said to us. Someone said something, maybe they weren't thinking about it, and boom, it takes us out, right? Words can create waves in our lives. A, I think just our approach. Sometimes it's not what we're going through, but the way we're choosing to go through it. Sometimes it's because we've chosen to have no margin in our lives. Our schedule is completely full. It's spending more money than you make. Or it's realizing your teacher, students, or your boss isn't mean. It's just the fact that you're a procrastinator. And so our own approach to how we're going thing, through things creates some waves in our lives. V, are voices. What voices are you listening to? TV shows, podcasts news stations. Here Again, my, my annual reminder, right? News stations are there to make money, not to give us information. They want to create anxiety so that you watch more. It's good to be informed, but we should do it with wisdom, right? Understanding what voices are we listening to? What agenda do they have? And we feel like, man, we're going through some waves, but it's actually just maybe the anxiety of what we're listening to. E, expectations. Sometimes I think we're surprised when we go through waves, when we go through tough times and storms. Right? Jesus said, hey, put on the full armor. You are going to face battles. And then when we go through battles, we're like, what? This is unexpected. We need to change our expectations from thinking everything's going to be smooth sailing to no, no, no. We have seasons of smooth sailing in between seasons of going through choppy waves. And then the S, I think shame. There's a big difference between shame and conviction. Conviction is good. That's when Jesus brings to mind something, our words, our actions, our beliefs, it's not in line with what God wants for us. And he wants us to repent, which means to change. Not just saying sorry, it's saying, no, no, okay, I'm going to change my actions, my attitudes, my beliefs, to be in line with what God wants. 
That's conviction. Shame says, I am a bad person. No one loves me. No one appreciates me. I can never do anything right. I can never be a good enough spouse. I can never be a good enough parent. Shame is from the enemy. Jesus wants you to reject those things. So again, those are some waves I think we go through. I want to talk about a story many of you probably know, but of Jesus and his disciples going through some wind and waves and storms. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 8. Otherwise, we've got the slides up here. Luke 8, verse 22. It says, one day, he, Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples. Again, I want to be like Jesus. I want to get in a boat. And then he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. This is the Sea of Galilee. And so they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. Ever felt swamped? This is what they're going through right now. They're feeling flooded, literally with water. A lot of times when we feel swamped, this creates anxiety in our lives. Now, there's a difference between general anxiety condition and acute anxieties. So real quick, just lesson on anxiety. There's really two basic kinds here. We have acute anxiety. And this is where our bodies are flooded with responsive chemicals because we feel like we're actually in danger or our kids are in danger. I have a friend, a uh, pastor's wife of a church we used to be at in Colorado. She was out hiking with her young boys uh, out near Boulder, Colorado. I think her boys were like eight and five around the time. And they're out by a waterfall. And she grew up in the Midwest, not around snakes. And they're going, and she sees a snake. She thinks there's a rattle on it. She thinks it's a rattlesnake. And she's concerned now that this snake is going to harm her boys. And she's flooded with acute anxiety. And her response, though, is literally to yell, everyone for themselves. And she runs off, looking back to make sure her eight and five-year-olds are falling behind them. And finally, they get back to their house. They burst in. They beat the mom to the house. And my friend Steve is sitting there working. And he's like, what happened? Like, we saw a snake. And he's from Australia. He grew up around poisonous snakes. He's like, awesome. What kind of snake was it? I don't know. But mom said everyone for themselves, right? That's acute anxiety. Or sometimes the snake's probably not going to actually hurt them, but we literally think we're in danger. And so that's a response that we can't really control because we think we're in danger. Then there's chronic anxiety is often based on a false threat. Here's what's really interesting, I think, about chronic anxiety. is so often chronic anxiety happens because we are trying to fulfill a need that only God can fulfill. And oftentimes, God's immutable, unshared attributes are what we are trying to fulfill. So, some of us, like myself, can be in situations where I feel like I have to be all-knowing. I have to have all the answers my kids ask me, or in a board meeting, or whatever it might be. But the reality is, I'm not all-knowing. Only God is omniscient and not all-knowing. Some of us, maybe we feel anxiety because we feel like we have to be everywhere. We have to be there for my kids and be there for my spouse and be there at volunteering and doing all these things. And have to be in multiple places and multiple times. And we feel like, oh, I, I can never have enough time for myself. I'm stretched in all these places. But the reality is only God is omnipresent. We aren't. We feel to, we have to be strong enough and to do everything and carry every weight. And show up for everyone when the reality is only God is <laughs> the word I'm looking for. He's all powerful, right? <laughs> Thank you, big words. Or, right, we feel like we have to be loving all the time, unconditional love for every single person. God wants us to be loving, but we aren't God. What I hope too is that maybe tonight that can even fill you with a little bit of relief. You aren't God. You aren't omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, pure, total love. Let God be God. And oftentimes, we're filled with chronic anxiety. We feel like the boat is swamped because we're trying to do something that only God can fulfill. Verse 24. And they went and woke Jesus up saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. 
I've never been in a boat that felt like it was sinking, but I've been in a plane where the turbulence was bad. I thought, we're going down, right? And if you've ever been to something like that, I mean, you are filled with prayer, right? Like, when there's really bad turbulence, there's really no more atheists left on the airplane. Like, you are praying hard. Just like I heard, no one's an atheist who clogs a toilet at their friend's house. Like, and it starts to overflow. Like, everyone starts praying, right? And so it's the disciples. Like, they think, we're going down. They are praying. Like, we're going to drown. And as Jesus awoke, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? He said, guys, did you forget? I'm on the boat with you. You've seen me do some amazing things. You saw me heal people. You've even seen me raise someone from the dead. Why are you freaking out? Now, here's what happened. This is the Sea of Galilee, and it's 680 feet below sea level. And so sometimes these storms would just come in and explode down. And very little warning. It's a beautiful day, and the storm would come out of anywhere. And so even though there's a few experienced fishermen on here, the storm is so unexpected, they're caught off guard, and it's violent. I think it's so often true for us today. Life can be going good, and then out of nowhere, right, a storm can hit. It's like you're having the best sales of your career. Your job is going great. Then your spouse goes to the doctor, and they find bad news. Right? It could be, you know, that your kid is doing really, really good. You think you're on the right track, and then all of a sudden you find out they've been making some mistakes. Your kid has been doing some things, and then nothing else matters, right? When your kid's in trouble and they're messing around with drugs or pornography or alcohol or something. Right? All of us have been in these situations where it feels like smooth sailing, and out of nowhere, a storm can hit. In fact, I think sometimes people in church are the best at hiding storms. These storms hit out of nowhere, and, and we're like, you know what, I'm fine. I don't want to talk about it. In our men's group, we're, we're trying, right, to be honest with each other. And uh, I'm going to call out one of the guys who isn't in the room, right? Because one of the other guys is like, hey, what's new? And something, what, something terrible had happened to him. And he's like, nothing. And so I turned to him, and yeah, as a pastor, I said, hey, liar, <laughs> right? And he's like, okay, fine. I lost my job. Yep. I'm like, good. Let's be honest. Because it's so easy to not want to share those things. We put up this false face and say, no, everything's fine. Everything's smooth sailing. In reality, we've been hit by this storm. But two things I want us to remember. Number one, you're in the storm with his presence. You're in the storm with his presence. Jesus was in the boat with his disciples. He, they weren't alone. I think oftentimes we think, well, if Jesus is with me, then there shouldn't even be a storm. It's like I gave my life to Christ. I raised my kids in the church. There should be smooth sailing from now on. Maybe we don't say that out loud, but we think it. But that's not true. What did Jesus say? In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus never promised that if you come to him or if you raise your kids in the church, it's going to be easy and storm-free. The reality is the opposite. When we move from darkness to light, suddenly we step into the middle of a spiritual battle. See, Christianity is not a playground, it's a battleground, amen? Between forces of darkness and forces of light. And when you step onto the team Jesus and the forces of light, the forces of darkness don't like that. They come against you. You and I will face opposition, you and I will face temptation, and there's spiritual warfare. And to think because I'm with Jesus, nothing bad should go wrong is a distortion of the message of the gospel. Look at Jesus' life. Look at all the early disciples' life. Look at the things they went through. We, too, are going to go through tough times, tough storms. Jesus never promised the storm is never going to rock you, but the storm is never going to sink you. Because if God is for you, if he's with you, there's nothing that can take you out of the presence of God. Jesus was on the boat. I think that's a game changer for us. Hey, Jesus is with us. I've read that people live longer if something alive is in the house with them. That even just a house plant can help you live longer. Or a cat or a gerbil or a dog or another person. That people live longer than if they're truly alone with nothing else alive in the house with them. And I think it's the same 
that when we're going through tough times, we need to know we're not alone in this. Jesus is with us. And hopefully, your church family is going with you through this. And so when, when you go through storms, when you go through the unthinkable, and people say, how can you keep going? You say, because I'm not alone in this. That even in the midst of this storm, Jesus is with me. Because someone is in the house with me. Jesus is in the boat. I'm not alone. I can sense his strength and his presence and his power and his comfort because I'm not alone in the storm. Never let the presence of the storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. See, as a pastor, people come to me and, and say, how can I be going through this? Unexpected death in our family, job losses, infertility, miscarriages. And as a pastor, you know what the temptation is? To give him some kind of Bible verse that can fit on a coffee cup. God works out all good things for the glory of those who love him. Right? Jeremiah 29, 11. Write all the plans I have for you. Our temptation is to want to come up with some kind of reason for the storm. Sometimes we will never know the reason for the storm. Sometimes people, they don't need a reason, they need reassurance. And instead of saying, God needed another angel, or, you know, because you sinned, this happened in your life, or, you know what, if you'd just been taking care of yourself, then you wouldn't have gotten sick. Sometimes we don't need to share a reason, we need to share reassurance. Hey, you feel alone, but you aren't alone. God is with you. Your church family is with you. People are with you. They love you. Something you can try when you feel like in your storm and you feel alone is to take some scriptures and to personalize them. So like Psalm 46.1. Instead of just reading, God is our refuge, say, God is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my ever-present help in a time of trouble. Read Hebrews 13.5 and change it to, never will my God leave me. Never will he forsake me. The 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not staying there because I'm walking through with you. And I will fear no evil because my God is with me. Scripture is meant to be read in community, but sometimes it's good to just take that and personalize it and, and change the pronouns to, hey, this is me. This is for me. He promised the storm. He said, it's not going to sink you, but it will rock you. And it's okay to have doubts. It's okay to wonder, but to know Jesus is with you in that storm. The second thing, though, is that you also, you are in that storm for a purpose. You're in the storm with his presence, but you're in the storm for his purpose. Think about it. Jesus said to his disciples, hey, let's go to the other side. Because he knew he needed to be on the other side. And he's going to teach his disciples some things with there. He knew there was a guy on the other side of the lake, possessed by a demon, and he's going to speak some healing into this guy's life. Jesus also knew, being God in the flesh, the storm is going to come. And he knew that taking his disciples into the boat, into the storm, this was Jesus' idea. Sometimes we think when you go through the storm, it's because of us. No, Jesus sent them into the storm. That was his purpose. And a lot of you, if you're in a storm, it's to know, hey, I'm in here with his presence, with his purpose. And here's the interesting thing, too, is that pretty much, I think Jesus sent them into the storm not to test them, but to teach them. Here's the interesting thing about uh, Jesus' miracles. Most of his miracles, he does for the crowds. The disciples are there, but he does those miracles for the crowds. It's very rare in the Gospels that only the disciples are the beneficiaries of Jesus' powers. Usually he's raising a little girl to life for the parents, right? He's feeding the 5,000. He's doing all these things to benefit one person who needs to be healed or raised to life or for the crowds to see. This is the one of the only times he does a miracle only in the presence of the disciples. I think he knew they needed this lesson. He's like, hey, you've seen me do some amazing things. 
that I need to teach you this, that I have power even over nature and the wind and the waves. Sometimes we go through storms because Jesus knows we need to learn something. Let's read on, verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. This is no longer part of the Jewish, um, uh, part of the Roman Empire. They've crossed over into Gentile land. And when Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion. For many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart for the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, And they rejoiced. Nope, they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country, the Gerasenes, asked him to stay and do more miracles. Nope, to depart from them. For they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home. And declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Disciples were in that storm with his presence, but also for a purpose. They needed to see Jesus still the wind and the waves. And Jesus had to get to this man who needed healing. A Gentile man, not a Jewish man. And he goes, and he heals this man, and he sets him free, and the town is freaked out. And this man says, hey, can I come please follow you, Jesus? And we think this is how the story is going to go. Jesus is like, yes, come be one of my disciples. What does Jesus say? No. Stay here. Stay where it's hard where you're surrounded by a bunch of dead things and fearful people. Why? To tell your story. And this is the first evangelist. The first person to talk about Jesus, to talk about what God has done to the people of his towns that he lived in. See, when you go through a storm, what doesn't matter is the reason. What matters is our response. Do we praise God? Do we respond with fear? Do we respond by sharing our story? We've been saying, how do we bless those around us? How do we reach people far from Jesus? Right? We've walked through this very simple thing, acronym of BLESS. We begin with prayer. Nothing of spiritual significance happens without prayer. Jesus oftentimes went to prayer first. That is where I have to start. We listen. What are the needs of those around us? We eat with people. We, we, we hear their stories, then we serve them with love. We meet tangible needs, and finally the last S is we share our story. Jesus says, share what God has done, and it says that he shares what Jesus has done. If you want people to know what God has done, talk about what has Jesus done in your life. That's what this man did. As I wrap up, I just want to give you a couple quick things on some very tangible, practical way. How can you share your story? I think this story, we can focus on Jesus calming the wind and the waves. We can talk about the disciples being fearful. But I want to focus on this man who was bound, who was possessed, who was lost. Jesus found him. Jesus saved him. Jesus redeemed him. And what was this man's response? To share his story boldly with everyone. 
even though they're filled with fear, even though they weren't Jewish people. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. We can pray. We can meet spiritual needs. We can, uh, physical needs. We can eat with people. We can serve them. But ultimately, at some point, we have to share the reason for our hope. Amen? Man, I hear this quote all the time. It's way taken out of context. Like, preach the, all, the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. It's necessary. Use words. We have to tell people why we're doing this. Why we are serving them. It's because of Jesus. Now, a couple things. Reasons my, why you might be reluctant to share your story. Number one, you think, I just don't have what it takes. Eric, I don't, I don't know how to share my story. I, I don't talk so good, right? I'm not so good with words. Maybe you're like, I just don't want to impose my beliefs on my family and friends. I, 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 I don't want them to be uncomfortable. Or maybe just sharing my story makes me feel uncomfortable. Every time we grow, though, is we have to grow through things that make us uncomfortable. The strength is in the stretch. We get better. We become who God wants us to be by doing hard things. And so here's, I just want to give you some tips how to share your story. Very simple framework. Number one, especially if you've been saved later in life, teenager, college, as an adult, here's a very simple framework. This is what life was like before Jesus. Here's what I was into. Here's the, here, here's the mistakes I made. Here's what I felt at night, when I was alone, here's what I, I tried to fill this need. Here's how I met Jesus. This person shared hope with me. I went to this event, whatever it might be. And then here's my life since I met Jesus. Very simple framework. Here's life before Jesus. Here's how I met Jesus. Here's how my life has changed since I met Jesus. Now, if you have a testimony more like me, you grew up in the church and you can't really remember a time uh, before knowing Jesus, number one, praise God. What a great testimony for your, your parents, your, the church you were raised in, right? Like, that's a good testimony. So it's like, well, then what do I share? I think one thing you can do is share about a storm you went through. Hey, here's what life was like before the storm. Hey, I went, I went through life. You know, everything was fine. I was just like, oh, it's, life is easy. I got married. We thought... It'd be so easy to have kids. My sister started popping out babies, right? This can be no problem. We get pregnant, yay. Ten weeks later, we lose the baby. And then another miscarriage. Three years of infertility. That was a storm, right? That was hard. That was tough. But Jesus carried me through that. And now since that, since we went through that storm, God has blessed us with four kids has used our story, our pain, to help people who go through that same thing. And I would never wish that on anyone, but I know God uses it. All of us have been through storms. Even if your testimony is like, man, I've been following Jesus my whole life, there's no way you've never been through a storm. And so you can share, hey, here's what life was like before this event in my life that changed things. Here's what it was like going through that thing and now here's what my life has been like since. See, people can argue with your theology, but they can't argue with your experience and your testimony. To say, this is my story. And I've heard so many testimonies of people who didn't grow up Christian, who didn't, you know, uh, know anything about Jesus, and some friend shares their story of, hey, this is what my life was like before. I was chasing all these things. I thought if I was a perfect student, if, you know, uh, type A, and I did everything right, everything perfect, you know, I had anxiety, all these things. I met Jesus. Life isn't perfect, but you know what? He's helped me through this. He's grown me through this. And the friend hears that story and thinks, and they can't get it out of their head. Because sometimes we can share theology. We can share the Romans road. We can share all these things, which are good. But that can go in one ear and out the other. But story, there's power in story. There's power in saying, hey, in the natural, there's no way I should be out of bed. Because it should have just overwhelmed me. But Jesus was with me through those tough times. And your friends who have different beliefs, again, they make, can debate these different things. But they can't debate your story. And it can get inside them. And as they think about it, they think about it. Sometimes it might take weeks or months or years, and eventually, like, you know what? 
I want that same story. I want that same experience. There's power in sharing our stories. There's a reason Jesus didn't just give, right, a list of beliefs and, and like, here's exactly how we act. We have stories of Jesus. We have teaching, right? But so much of the power of story to remind us of these things. That we're going through tough times, like, oh, yeah, that's right. The disciples went through a storm. But Jesus is with me for the storm. His presence is with me. That's right. I'm also in this for a purpose. Because after that storm, you know what? Jesus healed this person. Here's some tips for sharing your story. Number one, ask God for help. Everything starts with prayer. Say, God, I need your help. (laughs) I want to share my testimony. I want to share my story. I want this to impact my coworkers, my friends, my family. Number two, be yourself. Right? You don't have to change who you are or try to be a preacher or, you know, uh, give a TED Talk, whatever it might be. Be yourself. Number three, keep it real. Don't embellish the story. But be honest. Be real. Share. I doubted. This was hard. I yelled at God. I cursed at God. It's okay to be real. Keep it short. <laughs> You don't need to go on and on and on. And then practice your story out loud. The best way, if you're not used to talking and sharing your story, hey, practice it. Get together with some friends. I thought, man, should I actually have them do it tonight? I'm not going to make you do it. But I would love in the next week or two, think about it. What's your testimony you can share? Simple framework, right? Life before I met Jesus. How I met Jesus. What life has been like afterwards. Or... A storm in your life. What was life like before this event happened? That was a life-altering event. What was it like going through that? I think the more you can share what you felt, not just what you thought, that will really help to connect with people. That's a storytelling technique, right? And then what has life been like since? Resist the temptation to wrap it all up in a neat bow. The life is perfect, and it's always up into the right now. Because there's going to be a next storm. Practice the story. You know, talk with your kids about it. There's power in sharing our story. If we want to bless the world around us, we have to use words and share our testimonies and pray, Jesus, use me like you use Jesus to heal that man who was in bondage, living in a place of dead things. Help me to bring hope and healing. Imagine if all of us felt more free to share our stories. Not just our beliefs, our theology, all these things which are good and important, but our stories of how Jesus has changed our life, how Jesus has been with us, how his presence was there with us through the storms, how we went through this for a purpose. I'm going to pray, and then the band's going to come up, and we're going to do a little bit more um, time of worship. Two more songs. And my hope is that during this time, just kind of release whatever anxieties you're, ha- you're having. Again, I want to remind you, a lot of times those anxieties and stresses and things are because we're trying to be God when we're not. We're trying to be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, ever-present. Only God is. Ben, why don't you come up? I'm going to pray. And then during this time, just release to God what you need to release. And then receive from him what you need to receive. Courage to tell your story peace, hope, whatever that thing is. And then maybe during these last few songs too, you want to grab your connection card and be like, you know what? God has brought this thing to my head and I need prayer for this. Maybe it's simply, I've never shared my testimony with someone else. I've never done evangelism. I've never shared about Jesus. If you've never had the privilege of helping someone, cross the line of faith man I want that for you (laughs) I've been blessed I don't know 15 20 people in my life and that is just the best and I want that for you too I want you to share your testimony your story and watch someone else find freedom through Christ let's pray and then we'll sing these last two songs together Jesus I pray for all of us Give us courage to share our stories, our testimonies of how you've been with us through the storm. 
how your presence was there even when we were uncertain, even when we were filled with fear. And then God, how you've used it for a purpose. God, I pray you would use the pain and hurts of our lives as powerful testimonies to point other people to Jesus. Right now, I pray for your Holy Spirit to just be here among us, that we would listen and be stirred by whatever next step that is you want us to take. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for this last worship time.